So, here's my simplest explanation of the book of Revelation, especially the first four horses of the apocalypse. The question is, why these four? Why these colors? I'm going to submit to you that there is information contained in the colors. God is not trying to confuse us. And he's not just throwing colors out there, is he? No. There must be a rational uh, justification for why he picked these four. Don't you think? Okay. So take a look at your screen and just follow with me. What do you see? Here's the symbol, the national symbol of next door neighbor to Israel, Jordan. What colors do you see? Can you help me here? White, red, black, and green. Okay. And then if you go next door, inside the territory of Israel, there is the Palestinian, symbolized by that flag. Well, guess what? They look the same, don't they? So when people say the Palestinians need a homeland, guess what? They got it. It's called Jordan. When they divided Palestine, which used to be much, much bigger, 70-odd percent of Palestine went to Jordan. It was called Transjordan in the beginning, and then Jordan was the part for Palestinians to live. So if you're looking for a homeland for the Palestinians, Jordan should be opening up the floodgates and say, welcome, we welcome the immigrants. Why don't they? But flags tell you something. Colors tell you something. Let's go on. Uh, what colors do you see on the national flag of Sudan? This is another player in World War III, according to Ezekiel 38-39. Help me out here. Do you see white, red, black, and green? Okay, let's go to Kuwait. What do you see? White, red, great. Let's go to the United Arab Emirates. What colors do you see? Help me out. Let's make a chorus together. White, red, black, and green. All right, well, let's just go to Libya because it could just be coincidence here. What colors do you see? Okay, let's go to Afghanistan. What do you see? Let's go to Syria. What do you see? Let's go to Iraq. What do you see? I wonder if God has successfully communicated something through simple colors. Why is it so complicated? Why do prophecy teachers have to make it so hard? Because they watch the news first. In the days when Gorbachev was around and he was the enemy of Ronald Reagan, then it was Russia. Russia's the Antichrist. Russia's the white horse. And now China's coming up economically. Now it's China. China's going to invade Israel. I don't know if China's going to invade Israel. I don't know. But what I know is God said look for white, red, black, and green. Right? And if you look at it, what is ISIS trying to do? It's trying to combine Syria and Iraq. Let me flip that. Syria and Iraq. Syria and Iraq. Why are their flags so similar? Because historically they were the same empire. They were the same country. So ISIS is not as crazy as you think. There is a historical root to what is going on, what is being played out right now. Now you compare that to the flags of other nations. If you look at the flag of New Zealand, it's almost a copy of the flag of Australia. Because there's a intimate relationship. There's a connection between our two countries. You just take one star away and you color in the white stars red and you get the Kiwi flag. Then you look at the Aussie flag at the top left corner. It has a Union Jack, which is a copy of the English flag. Why is that? Because a lot of us came originally from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, including my, half of my ancestors, came from there. And so you can see the relationship and the history and the legacy of nations 
through the flags and their colors and symbols. God is aware of that. I guess Christians should be as well. Amen? So you compare the colors of the four horsemen to these other flags, and they, they just don't match. Let's go to other countries. What's the first flag on the left? America doesn't match. Second one? No way, I heard, good. Third one? Russia. To Americans, the evil empire. But they are passing more Christian laws than America is right now. Putin is the one that, that's criticizing the West, saying that the West has now become so, quote-unquote, egalitarian that faith in God and faith in Satan is equal. He says that's the path to degradation. Yeah, Vladimir Putin. He's not my hero. He's not my president. But I tell you what, that makes a lot of sense. You equate belief in God the God that gave us the Judeo-Christian value, philosophy, and religion that built the best civilizations in the world, you equate that with belief in idols or Lucifer himself? Something's going to go wrong. Amen? But look at this. All the countries that will be leading World War III all share the same four colors on their flags. God is not trying to confuse us. He has spoken very simply, succinctly, clearly. Don't think the book of Revelation is so hard. Amen? So those are the uh, first four seals. Let's continue with the fourth seal. Revelation 6 verse 8 continues and says, And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death. Please read it carefully. It does not say that a quarter of humans will die. Again, a lot of prophecy teachers, they just make a leap in interpretation, and the congregation maybe is just, you know, listening very carelessly. You read it, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, and suddenly everybody, you know, thinks that that means a fourth of the earth will die. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. All it says is power was given to them, the enemies, over a fourth of the earth. And things that they will do will be to kill with sword. Again, sword keeps coming up, doesn't it? Knives keep coming up, basically. Not guns. Not guns. In fact, I mean, if you read Revelation, you want not gun control laws. You want knife control laws. But we can't do that, can we? So, <clears throat> this is called hyperbole. A lot of preachers do this. They exaggerate what is written. They, they catch a word and then they just make leaps and bounds in interpretation. Try not to do that. Because if you do that with this verse, it would mean 1.75 billion people dead by the fourth seal. No, that is not going to happen. That's an exaggeration. All right? Realize that a lot of the events in the book uh, of Revelation and in the Bible, they're just going to happen and almost go unaware, unnoticed by people. It happened at the first coming, didn't it? And the believers thought what? If the Messiah comes, he's got to be powerful. He's got to be tough. He's got to have like two knives, right? And he's going to lead us in a great uh, war, in a victory over our enemies, the Gentiles and the Romans. And that is precisely why the Pharisees missed the Messiah. Because people were looking for something so spectacular. I'm telling you what, it's not Hollywood. I don't think there's ever going to be a 200-meter tsunami that engulfs the Statue of Liberty. I don't see it in the Bible. Even in the worst of times on this planet, the mercy of God is still here. God is still protecting as many people as he can, as many, as people, uh, as many people who dare to believe him. He's going to try. And so none of this stuff that, that's in Hollywood, I think, is going to happen quite that way. But it will still be bad enough and it will be clear enough if you're paying attention that the word of God is being fulfilled. 
All right? So don't look for something that is so hyperbolic, please. Uh, the fact is, a quarter of the human population is currently under Islamic control. Fifth seal. Revelation 6, verse 9. Let's read together. One, two, three. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. So in the fifth seal, what we're going to see is martyrdom. It continues and says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's a good question. Many saints have asked that. How long, how long? You ever ask that when you pray? How long, how long? Verse 11, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. I like that. Just a little bit more. Until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Let's harmonize that with a couple of other scriptures. Uh, there is martyrdom. What kind of martyrdom? Well, check it out. When they get to heaven, look at what had happened to them. Revelation 20 verse 4 goes back in time and tells you what happened. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark. So don't take the mark, whatever the mark is. Don't take the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So a characteristic of the end time is cruel decapitation. I wonder if this is happening. I wonder if this is being fulfilled. I'm going to give you one more scripture that I've not heard quoted before, but I believe that God gives typology. He gives foreshadowing of what happens. He, he gives you something that happened before the thing, the real thing that happens. Amen? It's a metaphor and then the real thing. A metaphor and then the real thing. You killed the lamb and then they crucified Jesus. Make sense? Well, check this out. In Luke chapter 9, verse 9, Herod, representing the world, the power of the world, Herod said, John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. John was the forerunner of Jesus in his first coming. John does what Elijah will do at Jesus' second coming. John ushers Jesus' first coming just like Elijah will usher Jesus' second coming. So what happened to John? What happened to the forerunner before the appearance of the Messiah? Just before the first revelation of Christ, the forerunner was beheaded. Could this be the same just before the second coming? 